we're glad you joined us for this really cool service. We're going to sing some great hymns right now. And uh, the words will be on the screen, and we just hope it's a blessing to you. This first song is called Wonderful Words of Life, and it's written by Philip Bliss. And he lived in the mid-1800s and helped with some of D.L. Moody's uh, revivals. And Philip Bliss was a, an itinerant music teacher, and one of his best uh, tools that he used was repetition. And in this song, Wonderful Words of Life, the, the lyrics, wonderful words, are used 18 times. So if you're familiar with this song, uh, you know exactly what I'm saying. It's a great hymn, and we hope it's a blessing to you. by C. Austin Miles, who uh, his favorite chapter in the Bible is John 20, with the exchange with Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And one day on that March day, when he was reading God's word, he was inspired. He was almost uh, had a vision of what it was like that morning uh, that the Lord was risen and uh, and uh, he was so inspired that he got his pen and paper and jotted down this, this very popular hymn that we sing today, I Come to the Garden Alone. Thank you. 
this holiday weekend, we uh, find our country in, in turmoil. And I'm reminded of Psalm 64, Psalm of David. The first words out of his mouth are, O oh God, listen to my complaint. Do not let my enemies' threats overwhelm me. Protect me from the plots of the wicked, from the scheming of those who do evil. Sharp tongues are the swords they wield. Bitter words are the arrows they aim. They shoot from ambush at the innocent, attacking subtly and fearlessly. And they encourage each other to do evil. So for our prayer time today, let's pray for our country. Uh, we're celebrating uh, Independence Day at this time of, of uh, the year, at this time of July every year. And uh, this year is, is unsettling to say the least. And uh, whatever we feel, whatever we, we uh, observe going on, uh, there's conflict in our government, on our, on our city streets, amongst our governors and our mayors, uh, amongst our students. And we, we need God to help us. So let's bow for a moment and I'll lead us in some prayer time. Uh, Lord, we, we pause to pray and remember these words of David that you could transplant these words from uh, thousands of years ago and you could pin those same words today and it would apply in here here in the United States of America and we pause today to praise you because there's nothing new under the sun you've seen uh, tension and riots and protests and death and corruption before. Uh, yet, will you look down upon this country today, Lord, and, and we seek your blessing and we pray for you to help us in our time of need. Many times we have felt under attack our values, our traditions, uh, the things that we hold dear uh, in our country and we see so much chaos. We, we ask you, God, to forgive us of our sin and renew the spirit of America and renew our spirits as we have been uh, uh, through a global pandemic and we, we still are feeling the effects of that and managing our lives in the midst of all these changes that, that we see and we experience. And we pray for uh, the violence, the confusion, the hatred. We pray, God, that you bring about peace. And we pray for our churches in America to uh, be lights in the darkness and for uh, those who do violence and uh, who seek to confuse and uh, bring about chaos and anarchy. We pray, Lord, for their hearts to change. We pray that, that your hand would come up and say no more, that you've had enough. And, and God, if you could turn the tide and bring about peace and love and harmony and use your church to lead the way. We thank you for today. Thank you for our country. And we pray, God, for peace and harmony. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And uh, the last verse of Psalm 64 says, the godly will rejoice in the Lord and find shelter in him. And those who do what is right will praise him. So we're gonna continue 
to praise Almighty God and His Son, Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us. We're going to trust and claim these promises that God will uh, give us joy and peace and delight in these uncertain times. We're going to sing one more song before our message, and I hope you've been appreciating the squeaky pedal on the piano. We thought it was the stool, but it wasn't the stool. It was the right pedal, so we'll try to get that fixed for next time. But this next song is called He Lives, and it's another great hymn that's sung all over our country. It was written 30 years after the last song we sang, I Come to the Garden Alone. And Alfred Ackley wrote the song, and he borrowed a phrase, he walks with me and he talks with me, right? We sang that in the last hymn. It's also in this hymn. And back in the era of uh, the writing of the hymns, there wasn't anything uh, like plagiarism. Uh, there was a camaraderie of using uh, some of the same lyrics in other people's songs because of the common cause of worshiping God and proclaiming Christ as Savior. So let's sing these three verses of He Lives. study and we're going to walk through the Beatitudes, that very first part of the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to call this study an Upside Down Kingdom because that's what Jesus' kingdom is all about. It's where the first become last and the last become first. It's where outsiders become insiders and insiders become outsiders. It's a kingdom where the broken and the lost and the confused and the desperate, where they have a place 
in God's kingdom. And this sermon that Jesus gave, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and you can read it in Matthew chapter 5. And so if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Is kind of the introduction to this kingdom, if you will. It's a place where we, we have the kingdom law. In the Old Testament, we have Moses who gave the Israelites the law. He was on Mount Sinai. This is the law of the new kingdom. And we're not going to go through the whole thing. We're just going to go through the first part, the Beatitudes. And what we need to remember is that when Jesus was talking, they wouldn't just stop and take it, you know, line by line or uh, word by word. This was designed to get the people to think. It was kind of like this shot in the arm, if you will. And so right now, I just want to take um, and read through, uh, read through the Beatitudes. Here's what happened. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. He says this. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he had sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who went before you. So can you imagine watching Jesus and going to where he was teaching sitting down and he just kind of says this to you can you imagine what that would have felt like can you imagine hearing all those things rapidly fired at you saying wow that's it's a crazy kingdom the, the values of the world are not the values of the kingdom and yet at the same time the values of the kingdom are what we want to be a part of and so like i said when jesus first taught this they he didn't go word by word and explain what it meant. It was just, that was a sermon. Now, it is important for us to, to walk through this slowly and to understand what those words mean in their context and how we can apply them to, to our life. And that's what we're going to be doing in this study, the upside down kingdom. And so today we're going to start in verse, we're going to start with the, in, in, verse, in verse 3 where it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the first question we get is, what does it mean by this word blessed? And what it means is that there's this underlying tone of, of having this joy, of, of being happy, not in the sense of happiness that, that comes and go with your circumstances, but a deep happiness, a deep joy. That despite, what, despite whatever is going on in your life, you can experience this. You, you will be blessed. In other words, you will, have, you will have God's favor on your life. You will experience favorable circumstances, if you will, as you're going through trials and tribulations, favorable circumstances for your heart. In other words, this, this joy will run deep in your soul. And so he starts and, and he says this, um, blessed are the poor in spirit. And poor in spirit means that we need Christ. It's meaning that we are not satisfied with what we have, but we want more of God. In other words, it, 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 when he's describing these people, it, it's people that recognize that they are spiritually bankrupt and that they have this desperate cry for God and the, and the provision of God, that there's this hunger for God. And we see this hunger. Uh, we see this hunger described um, throughout all of Scripture. Maybe you've experienced this too. One of the, the places in the Bible that describes this hunger that, that kind of resonates with me is it's found in Psalm 42, 1 through 2, and it says this, As the deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So just as the deer pants for water, we long for God. We long for his word. Uh, the author of the time was longing for the temple. We long for his church, which is the temple. 
We long for God. We, we are hungry for His, for fellowship. We're, we're hungry for Him. I don't know about you, but these last few weeks, these last few months have been kind of crazy. And I've just noticed that I've kind of been tuning out to the news, seeing that the news isn't important. But it's not satisfying. Social media, it's not, it's not satisfying. There's something that, that when we're on those sites, when we're on, when we're on social media, when we're looking at the news, when we're engaged with the things of this world, we, we leave hungry. And there's a part of us that longs for something deeper, longs for, for things that's, that withstand the test of time. And so I've just been finding myself going more and more to, to God's Word, to, to look at words that were written much before my time, um, but they're words that are God's Word. And, and it's one of those things that we remember, that God spoke things into existence, and the Word became flesh, and that's Jesus, and He left His words in, in Scripture, and and all of that, but there's something about God's Word, about sinking our lives into um, His commandments. And so we long for this. And we see, though, that this, that this hunger that we long for, that it's met, that Jesus meets us when we're hungry, that, we, that when we are spiritually dry, when we are spiritually broken, when we are spiritually uh, desperate, that when we are spiritually bankrupt, Jesus meets us. In fact, He says this in... Um, a little bit further on in, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, 33, he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added on to you. In other words, that he will provide for our needs. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount um, in Luke's Gospel, he says that, that God will give you his spirit. And there's something about that. But when we're desperate for God, God comforts us with his spirit. He meets our spiritual hunger. And not only that, but we recognize that not only does he meet our needs at a minimum, but he gives us strength. In Isaiah 40, 31, it says this, even youths, 40, 30 through 31, it says this, even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. So it talks about how this culture is exhausted, that they, that they just can't go on anymore. But he says here, but they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Look at what he's saying. He's saying that those who wait, and so when we're hungry for God, when we're waiting for God to move, when we're waiting for God's anointing with the Spirit, as we're waiting for that, um, that he, it's in that waiting that he renews their strength. And, and that strength, when we're working out of the strength that God gives, we don't become weary. But we run, we don't become weary. So here, if that's the blessed are the poor in the spirit, what do we receive? For those who are hungry, for those who are desperate, for those who are spiritually bankrupt, what then do they receive? He says that for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And here's what it means, is that we get to experience, if, if you're hungry for God, if you're hungry for His righteousness, if you're hungry for His presence, if you're, if you're hungry for the things of the kingdom, that God says that He will meet you, that He will give you a taste of the kingdom. And so we recognize that the kingdom is something that's far off, but it's also something that we can experience today. And so how do we experience that kingdom? How do we experience that kingdom? Well, 1 John 1, 7 says this. 1 John 1, 7 it says this. But if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In other words, we receive, we get to experience this kingdom because we get to be with him, as he is in the light. We get to be with Jesus as he is in the light. We have fellowship then, not only with Jesus, but with other believers. We have fellowship with Jesus and the church, with, with other people who are like-minded, with other people who are poor in spirit. And, and in that moment, in, in that environment of fellowship with him and fellowship with other people, he cleanses, he cleanses us from our sin. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sin. And what we recognize is this, is that Jesus is enough. And so I would say that the first thing for we get to experience the kingdom is that we get to experience Jesus himself. Um, the phrase that's very popular around Salt Lake is Jesus is enough. 
And, and, and he is. The other thing, though, is, is this, is that we get to experience a spiritual power. Um, look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Now, this was after Jesus um, was crucified, was buried, he rose again on the third day, and he was meeting with his disciples. And Acts chapter 1 tells us about Jesus' cor coronation event, where he, he enters into, into heaven. But before he enters into heaven, before he ascends into heaven, he's giving the disciples instructions about the kingdom. And they asked God, or they asked him, Jesus, when are you going to restore the kingdom? When, when is it that you're going to um, expand your rule? And he says, it, it, that's, just, just wait, just wait. It's not about the time you're here. Just wait. You, you need to wait. And, and here's what it says in Acts chapter one eight. It says this: But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. And to the end of the earth. In other words, just, just wait. Wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the power of the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will have power. You will experience the power. So those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We get to experience the kingdom of heaven in, in, in the way that we get to experience Jesus. But not only that, we get to experience the power of the Holy Spirit running through this as, as a witness to, to the people around us. And it comes through fellowship with Christ. But here's another one, verse 4, chapter, um, our needs are met in the kingdom. Philippians 4, 19, he says this. This is Paul writing to the church in Philippi. And he says this, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory. Christ Jesus. Here's what he says. He says, I'm going to meet your needs. I'm going to be your provider. I know exactly who you are. I know how you're made up. I know how, how you're wired. I know everything about you. My, my goal is to bring in your life exactly what you need. Now, it might be through suffering. Just before this, in, in Philippians chapter 4, um, in, the same, in the same section of Scripture, he says, Paul talks about how he knows what it's like to have a little... He knows what it's to have a lot, what it's like to have a lot. And so what he's talking about here is not necessarily physical needs, although that can happen as well. But he says, I know you. You are my child in the kingdom. And, and God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Jesus Christ. He can meet our physical needs. He can meet our spiritual needs. So that's the first line in, in the Beatitudes. Remember, this is an upside down kingdom. The first will be last, and the last shall be first. Insiders become outsiders, and outsiders become insiders. And the first line that we get is that blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we do. We, we look at this world and we recognize that it is not satisfying. God, we chase after the things of this world and we're left hungry. We're left desperate. We're left spiritually bankrupt. But God, you tell us. You tell us that when we're bankrupt spiritually, that you will meet our needs, that, that ours is the kingdom of heaven, that we get to experience the kingdom today. So Father, we praise you. We thank you for being faithful. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Hey, let's go ahead and sing Just As I Am as we reflect on the message and as we prepare for communion.
Now is the time in our worship service that we invite anybody who's a believer in Christ, anybody who has surrendered their life to Christ, uh, to participate with communion with us, to participate in the Lord's Supper. So I want to encourage you to, to go ahead and get some bread and get some juice, and I'll lead you through some directed prayer. Um, you know, as we, as we look at the elements, as we look at the bread, as we look at the juice, we remember Jesus' life. Remember his body, which was crucified on a cross, and we recognize his uh, blood that was spilled for the forgiveness of sins. And so we, as we come to this moment in a worship service, it's a time to examine our hearts. And there are different things that, that, come, that go through your mind. You know, there's sometimes where um, we, we come, we gather together as a church body, and things are going really well. And you just have this relationship that's with that's on fire with Christ, and you know you're, you're spending time in the Word, you're spending time loving your neighbor, you're here you're sacrificing, you're, you know you are just on fire for for Jesus and His kingdom. But there's other times where we come to a church gathering, and we are not on fire. We're not on fire for a couple of reasons. One is that. Maybe we've just kind of drifted a little bit. And, or, or maybe it's not that we've drifted, it's that we've kind of gone a different direction. We have not been living our life in line with the gospel. And so whether wherever you are in your spiritual journey, we come to this moment in a worship service that's kind of an anchor. It's kind of a, a time where we can redirect our focus and we can either say, God, Thank you so much for being the anchor of my soul. Thank you for being on the throne of my heart. But there's other times where we say, we come to God in prayer and we say, God, you know what? You, I, I have not had you on the throne of my heart. <laughs> you may have been in the room or, or maybe, you know what? I thought you were in the room and now you, I, I, I kind of just push you to the side. But it's good that we can come together and we can say, God, I'm sorry. And I'm repenting. I'm no longer putting you to the side. I'm taking you and I really am. I'm putting you on the throne of my heart again. I'm moving my life back in line with the gospel. So wherever you are today in your spiritual journey, and, and just take a few moments and go to God in prayer. Go to God in prayer and prepare your heart to receive communion. as we reflect on our own relationship with Jesus, on his, on his sacrifice that he made for us, we, we recognize that it's not just about us, that Jesus came and he invites everybody into the kingdom. Everyone is invited. And so as we reflect on our own relationship, it reminds us that there are others who are around us, who are in proximity of us, who have never surrendered their life to Christ. It might be a son or a daughter. It might be a mom or a dad. It might be your spouse. It could be a coworker. It could be a close friend. But whoever it is, there is someone in your life who has never surrendered their life to Christ. Would you just take a moment and pray for them that they would surrender to him, that they would receive his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness? Go ahead and pray for them right now. So Jesus was eating the Last Supper with his disciples. He was eating the Passover meal with them. And they were going through all, all the stuff, and they were kind of winding down. And it got to this point in the meal. And, and look at what happens. He says, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Go ahead and eat the bread. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Go ahead and drink the juice. 
I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink new with you in my Father's kingdom. Father God, again, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you that we can come boldly into your throne room and praise you and ask for forgiveness and just have a relationship with you. God, we, we praise you for that. We thank you for your death, for your burial, for your resurrection. But God, we also pray for those who are around us who don't know you. God, we ask that you would spark something in them. God, you tell us that your Holy Spirit convicts people of their sin. And so, Father, God, we ask for our family members, we ask for our neighbors, we ask for our coworkers, and for our friends, that you would just convict them of their need of a Savior. And, and God, I pray that you would use us to proclaim your gospel to them. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, we are so, so, so glad you joined us, and we hope you've been blessed today with our service. And we're just going to sing the first verse of Wonderful Words again as we close our service together.